Okay, we've seen what a topological space is. We've seen one way of defining a topology on a space by specifying a base. And now I want to show you another way of constructing topologies on spaces, which is really useful. So let's suppose we have some topological space, x, we have a topology t. And suppose that y is a subset of x. Then I claim y inherits a topology from the topology of x. So define a topology on y by declaring a subset u and y to be open if there exists an open set v in the topology on x so v is a subset of x such that u is v intersect y So let's do an example. Let's suppose that uh, x is the plane R2 equipped with its metric topology coming from the Euclidean metric on R2. And let's suppose that y is just some curve, like this. So what might an open subset of y look like? Well, I just need to take an open subset of x, the ball, and intersect it with y. And that gives me a little interval like this inside the curve. This is an open ball, so that's like an open interval. So that's an example. Those are the kind of sets you get as open sets of y. Let's do another example, which is a bit more counterintuitive. Again, let's take R2 as the, uh, the space x, but y is going to be the square, like 0, 1 times 0, 1, in, sitting inside the plane. So that's a closed square. Right? I've used closed intervals to define the square here. So this is a closed square, but I claim that in the subspace topology on Y, that square is an open set. And it has to be, right, if Y is going to have a topology because the whole space is supposed to be an open set. And the reason is because I can just take this open disk and look where that intersects y, and it intersects y in the whole square. So by definition, that whole square, despite the fact it looks very closed, is an open set. I should stress, it's an open set in the subspace topology of y, it's not an open set in the plane. So this is just two different topological spaces, and the square is inheriting the subspace topology. So I'm going to leave it to you guys to check that this definition actually gives you a topology that meets the requirements of a topology. Instead, I'm just going to give you a bunch of examples of things that you always thought of as topological spaces um, that now you can equip with a topology. So, for example, the circle. S1, that is the set of points uh, Z in the complex numbers such that the length of Z is 1. All right, there's always a distinction between the circle and the disk. The disk is the thing with the inside colored in. The circle is just the boundary. So that's a subset of the plane, subset of the complex plane, whatever. 
save R2. Um, so it gets a subspace topology. And if ever I talk about the circle, this is the topology I mean. You know, in higher dimensions, you get the sphere. For example, S2 is the set of points x, y, z, in R3, such that x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. This is the surface of the Earth. This inherits a subspace topology from R3. And more generally, the three sphere, which sits inside four space, the four sphere, which sits inside five space, they all inherit topologies from the ambient Euclidean space. And the Euclidean space has a topology because it's a metric space. Another very famous example of a topological space is the torus or donut, um, which again is a subset of R3. So this inherits a topology. When I say torus, again, I only mean the surface of the torus. The inside where the jam would go is not part of the torus. That would be a solid torus. So this is called T2 because it's a two dimensional thing, like it's got two coordinates, one that goes around like this and one that goes around like this, the longitude and the latitude. So this has a topology, you know, any surface you care to draw, genus two surface here has a topology coming from R3. So all your favorite topological spaces get a topology this way. So the torus actually can be embedded into four dimensional space as well. And it inherits topology, which is essentially the same as the topology it has in R3. It's what's called homeomorphic to it, um, which is like isomorphism in the category of topological spaces. So how do you see the topology sitting inside four dimensional space? Well, if you think of these two coordinates, the longitude and the latitude as some angular coordinates, phi and theta, then you can define the map that takes the point with longitude and latitude phi and theta to the point cos theta sine theta cos phi sine phi in R4. As you see, as theta varies, this traces out a circle in an R2 factor in R4, and as theta uh, phi varies, this second pair of coordinates traces out a circle in the complementary R2. Okay, so this also gives D2 a topology. And as I've said, it turns out to be homeomorphic to the torus that you get in R3. But what's very different is the geometry that's sitting on this torus, right? So this torus, you can measure distances, inherit a metric from R3 just by looking at paths that live on the torus and looking at the lengths of those paths. And that's a weird curved geometry, right? Because um, in this region over here, it turns out to have positive curvature. In this region over here, it turns out to have negative curvature. And the geometry that you get from R4 on the torus is actually not curved at all. So this is what's called a flat torus. I'm not going to justify any of this, but uh, this, is, this is a curved geometry. So the metrics you get on the torus in R3 and the torus in R4 are very different, but the topologies that you get are the same. So we'll talk some more about homeomorphism of topological spaces in a later video. And for now, I want to prove a lemma about the subspace topology. So uh, let X T be a topological 
equal space. Let y be a subset of x. And let's write um, s with a subspace topology. Let i be the map from y to x, which is the inclusion map that just says a point in y sits somewhere in x. Then, first of all, i is continuous. When I say that, I mean with respect to the topology S on Y and T on X. And moreover, S is the coarsest topology For which i is continuous. In other words, if um, you can find some other topology, t prime, maybe s prime, on y, such that this inclusion map is continuous with respect to that, then the subspace topology is a subset of this topology S prime. In other words, all of the open sets in the subspace topology have to be there in S prime. I mean, so in fact, we could have actually defined the subspace topology to be the coarsest topology for which the inclusion map is continuous. That's what this is saying. So how do I show the inclusion map is continuous? Well, um, I take some open set uh, V in X and I look at its pre-image uh, So what's the pre-image under the inclusion map? Well, it's the set of points in Y which live in V. That is, it's Y intersect V. And if I go back and look at the definition of the uh, subspace topology, that means precisely that that intersection is an open set. Right, so that, that's it. That proves that the inclusion map is continuous. It's pretty much defined, the topology defined in such a way that it's continuous. And what happens if we had a different topology for which the inclusion map is continuous? Well, if um, the inclusion map is continuous for S prime, then we can just argue exactly as in the previous line, if we take any open set V in X this is now a continuous set the pre-image of V under the inclusion map by assumption right we're assuming that I is continuous in S prime but again by what I said before this is V intersect Y so all of the open sets that were in S of these guys have to be open in S prime. So 
which means that s is a subset of s prime. So this way of defining topologies that I've alluded to by giving some map or maps and saying this topology is the coarsest or most refined, whatever, for which this map is continuous, um, that's a useful, useful thing you can do. And actually, the product topology we saw in the last video can be defined that way. Um, so uh, what are the maps in that case? Um, so the product topology is the coarsest topology on x times y for which the projection maps onto the two factors are continuous. Right, so the thing that just takes x, y to x, and the thing that takes x, y to y. So both of these have to be continuous. And I'll, I'll leave that as something for you to think about. But here's a nice, a nice corollary of this, um, of the last two facts. If I consider the maps sine theta and cos theta as maps from the circle to the real numbers, then these are continuous maps. Right? So theta is the angle coordinate on the circle. Proof. What is this cos and sine theta? Well, I have the inclusion map from S1 into R2, and I have the two projection maps from R2 to the x-axis and the y-axis. And by definition, the projection of the circle onto the x-axis is the function of cos and the projection onto the y-axis is the function of sine. All right, so cos theta is a composition of a continuous inclusion map with a continuous projection, so it's continuous. This sine is, is a, again, a composition of inclusion which is continuous and a projection which is continuous. In particular, if we whiz back a page and look at this formula here, you can see that I'm thinking of the flat torus in R4 as a product S1 times S1, and then this map to R4 is a continuous map because it's just a bunch of continuous maps being bumped together in a, in a row. Okay, so we've now seen a bunch of constructions of topological spaces which give us actually a huge variety of spaces, uh, subspaces, products, metric spaces. And um, so what I'm going to do next is talk about properties of topological spaces like connectedness, compactness. And finally, there'll be another construction of topological spaces which we haven't considered yet called the quotient construction, which is ex extremely useful. Um, and I'm going to talk about that later.